back again. I uh, just wanted to uh, update on the status of this T1100. I made a post about it in my community tab, uh, but I thought I would share it uh, as a video as well. So I did the video uh, of the unboxing of everything. And uh, in that video, of course, I tried to plug it in, turn on, get it to do something. And it did do something. The floppy drive actually ran, but absolutely nothing else was happening. So I let that be a fail because there's a bigger video going on. And yeah, when that was done and I finally put things away, I kind of went, ah, you know, I should just pop it open, just have a look at a few screws. And I was kind of reluctant to do that because I have so many projects on the go and you start taking things apart and the screws get lost. You know, I try my best not to lose these things, but yeah, and then it ends up being, okay, this is possibly broken. Maybe I need to investigate that. So then it sits taking up space on my bench, not actually being repaired until I kind of hit upon whatever it is that needs to be done. But uh, in this case, I got very, very lucky. And the cause of the problem turned out to be pretty much exactly what it usually is with these machines. So anyway, I'll just take you through uh, what I did. Uh, obviously, I had to unscrew the thing. And the nice thing about these early Toshibas is they're mercifully easy to disassemble. There are other laptops of this era, you know, 286 laptops. Uh, I have a Mitsubishi which uh, has that Miniscribe hard drive that appeared in my really big Miniscribe video. That thing was an absolute nightmare to take apart because the screen is on a really, really short leash and uh, trying to maneuver it to a place where you can get it apart safely is, is really tricky. But these are easy. Uh, you basically have three screws on the bottom and then you have three screws on the back here. When I went to unscrew it, I knew right away that somebody had been messing around with it before because uh, only the middle screw was still there. So, you know, that's typical. Over so many years, somebody eventually will try and mess with the thing when it stops working. So yeah, I unscrewed everything and then I very carefully removed the top. It's a little bit of a dance, but it's not that hard to do, except when it's being filmed. Yeah, and just very carefully moved it over. Now, of course, you can help yourself a lot by just taking this connector off, but I'm kind of lazy a lot of the time. Um, maybe I'll just move the keyboard out of the way. So you can see the motherboard is overall pretty darn clean. So that was kind of the opposite of what I was expecting. I was thinking I was going to see capacitor cheese everywhere or, you know, the batteries all leaking out goo and stuff rusted away uh, because the fault was really, really strange. You know, the floppy drive was running. In my experience with these T1000 series machines, at least the earlier ones, is usually the floppy doesn't do anything uh, unless the computer is, is actually running. So I kind of got thrown off by that a little bit. So anyway, the first thing that I always do whenever I run into a situation like this is I first start removing anything that can be removed on the off chance that maybe that part is causing a problem. And this is something that I have a lot of painful experience with. I have a Zenith Z100 machine that sat on my bench for, God, like almost two years because it wasn't starting up and I was convinced the power supply was the issue. I wasn't realizing that the power supply has to have something connected to it and drawing power in order for it to turn on. And uh, I ended up waiting until I could find another power supply, got another power supply, had the same problem. And then I had a brainwave, hey, maybe I should pull out this floppy disk controller that's at the back. And I did, and as soon as I did that, the thing started and both power supplies turned out to be working. So it's kind of become my custom to just try and remove anything that is not essential to booting up the machine to try and eliminate any potential problems. Now, obviously, uh, removing the battery pack would typically be the first thing you would do in a situation like this, because after 34 years, it's practically guaranteed that these are going to be dead and they're gonna be leaking acid and all kinds of stuff all over the board. Problem with the Toshiba T1000 series up to, I don't know what model number, is they require the batteries in order to start up. You have to have uh, at least 10 volts at this connector here, or 12 volts ideally to actually run the machine. It relies on this battery in order to get that. I'm not sure why, I don't know what the reasoning is. I'm sure there's a very smart engineering reason for it. 
So obviously disconnecting the battery in this case, you know, <laughs> it's not going to make anything work, unfortunately. But I did remove it anyway because I just wanted to, you know, inspect everything underneath. And everything looks nice and clean. Like there was no sign of any kind of corrosion with the battery terminals. So yeah, I kind of put that aside. And then once I was assured that everything was nice and clean and you know, there was nothing obviously rusting away, I connected the battery again and I started trying to fire the machine up. And every time I did, I'd get the floppy drive running endlessly, but no post. So then I started removing other things uh, like this modem, serial board. I think this might be a real-time clock on here because it's got that watch battery. Uh, and nothing that I did seemed to change anything. I tried disconnecting the screen. I tried everything. I tried switching over to the CRT to see if it was putting something up there. Nope, nothing. You just turn on and the floppy drive runs maddeningly for eons and nothing happens. So eventually I hit upon the brainwave of removing the power connector from the floppy drive just to see if maybe the floppy drive was shorting out or some weird thing was happening. And when I did that, suddenly it turned on. It, it literally, uh, I could see the screen, uh, you could see this like blue flashing thing that happens. And then next thing I knew, I had a memory count. I was like, what? I was really, really happy about that. So then I thought, okay, well, I'm going to confirm my diagnosis here and I'm just going to plug the floppy connector back on. One thing that I found with this floppy drive is the, um, you see the plastic receptacle that this mounts to, it's actually sliding off the pins, so it's not secure. So my working theory was maybe it was shorting or something and readjusting it would work. Nope, as soon as I plugged it back in and I turned the machine on, it was fine. So then I grabbed a boot disk and I put it into the floppy drive and I tried powering it up and you know, it was trying to read, but it wasn't actually doing anything. It was coming up with data errors. So I cleaned the heads with uh, some alcohol solution. And I also exercised the heads a little bit to make sure that it wasn't all jammed up from years of sitting there. And yeah, then basically I put in a brand new boot disk that I made using WinImage and turned it on and it booted right up. And it was like, Yes, because <laughs> this has just been like the greatest lot ever. Everything seems to be working, except for the mic, which is a different thing. I'm going to test that uh, very carefully when I go to, but I have pretty good confidence it'll probably be fine or it'll le at least do something. Uh, another thing I'll note, I don't know if it's easy to see here, but there's the uh, memory expansion card. So this has 512K of RAM. There's 256 on the board and there's 256 on that card. The card was kind of off kilter. It was like off at an angle. So that was another thing that kind of clued me in that somebody had been messing around in here. And uh, yeah, I thought, you know, for a quick win, maybe if I just plug that in, everything would work, but it didn't. It ended up being that I had to take the floppy drive power cable off, plug it back in, and then suddenly it worked. Now that left me with a question, why was it suddenly working? Anyway, I finished up with it for the night. I shut it down, I unplugged it. I always unplug old laptops because I don't uh, like leaving old power adapters and old laptops connected because you never know what's going to happen. And I came back in the afternoon the next day and decided to fire it up to, you know, try testing some software with it and it wouldn't start. It was back to doing the floppy running thing and I was like, okay, what is going on here? So anyway, I let it sit for a bit while I was looking at the documentation for the Toshiba on a website. And uh, I just sort of happened to decide to turn it on again at one point just to see if anything had changed. And it did, it booted up perfectly. And then when I was uh, shutting it down, I unplugged it inadvertently before shutting it off and thinking that that would cause it to just immediately die, but it didn't, it kept running. <laughs> so it's like the battery pack is holding power. It's actually taking a charge. I was like, what? So yeah, I, uh, I kind of forgot again last night to unplug everything and this was left basically charging all night. And I've turned it on and it actually is powering up off the battery. So I can't really tell, you know, I, I don't think these batteries are a replacement. They look pretty original to me, but maybe they are. Maybe somewhere, you know, years down the line, but still a ways in the past, somebody replaced this battery pack. Anyway, uh, just for fun, I thought we'll put her back together here and uh, we'll just turn on and play a couple of games and see how it uh, reacts. 
It's not going to be the most impressive uh, gaming experience, of course, because these old uh, LCDs without the backlighting and just the single color pixels to work with uh, are not very pleasant to look at. But hey, but what can you do? It's a vintage and this is the original first Toshiba like ever. So um, I'm just going to plug that back in. Now I'm going to put this combination modem serial port I think this must be some sort of a clock or something because it's got this 2032 watch battery on it. It's obviously intended to keep some sort of information uh, long term. I don't have a 2032 handy. I usually do. And you know what? I'm not that worried about it. I don't think we need it to keep the time. There we go. Okay, and then that fits in like so. Okay. Uh, now we need to put the floppy drive cover back on. I couldn't figure out. I'll have to look up that model number FD3508 and find out who made this. No. Not sure if it goes over or under. Oh, just like that. There's our shield. There we go. So the battery pack basically just sits in here. Plug it in. Just kind of grooves on in there, I think. At least I thought it did. It's supposed to be easy. But it's not. I think this just kind of hooks over there and then that sits like that. It's, uh... <laughs> I assume it's supposed to be held in place by this tab here, but I don't think that tab's doing that job anymore. Okay, and then the keyboard just comes like that. Okay. Believe me when I tell you, this is actually one of the easier ones to work on. Uh, I've seen far worse out of Toshiba and out of others. Okay. Now here's the fun part, is getting it to sit down together. So everything's just kind of crammed in there. It's got to be exactly right, or it will not sit. Something I'm missing. Okay. I got this seated right. Maybe I don't. There we go. Okay, that feels better. There we go. Now, before I go and screw it all back together, just make sure it actually still turns on. And I'm doing this straight off the battery. Like, <laughs> wow. I thought NICADs, you got X number of years out of them and they just died and that was it. And then they just leaked their guts everywhere and never worked again. But this is literally running, like here's the cord. There's no power being plugged into this thing. It's strictly running off those batteries. I'm gonna have to test this and see how far they go. Yep. Now she's loading up. I mean, that's just unbelievable. <laughs> that just doesn't happen on this bench very often. Now, I was a little bit wrong about the documentation being light for these. There are some sites, some really good sites that have really good information on basically fixing a lot of these issues. And one site that I was on uh, clearly explained how to hook up a 12 volt power source to the battery power rails and power the laptop up doing that. So that's the alternative way of dealing with it. The machine runs off of 12 volts, basically. The 18 volts DC that the power supply puts out 
gets regulated down to whatever the machine needs. Okay, so that's good. So we'll just screw everything back together here. Yeah, I, as far as the batteries go, I mean, I have no idea how long those will hold out. If they're holding any kind of charge, I'm hoping that maybe, you know, indefinitely I can keep the laptop working. I don't expect to, to work off the batteries by any means on a regular basis, but maybe they'll stay just good enough to let the machine keep starting up for a while, which would be really nice. That's a missing a screw there. All right, now for the fun part. Okay, so we're all set up here on the bench, ready to go. I've already got a boot disc made up, but I do need to make up some discs with some programs. This is a 720K, three and a half inch floppy. I don't know about everybody else out there, but I'm finding working 720K floppies to be a real challenge to find these days. Uh, most of the ones that I have in my collection that I've had for years are definitely starting to fail, usually bad sectors. Thankfully, when I bought an Apple IIc Plus many years ago, the seller threw in a whole box of these red 720K floppies. So. I'm very hopeful that at least one of these will help us out. Uh, in fact, that's exactly what I used uh, to build the boot disk for this thing. So I'll be right back. Okay, we're all set up here. I'm actually sitting on the floor because it's really hard to get the screen aligned just so with the camera and get all the detail in without any fuzziness or any lights glaring off the screen. And that's indeed what I kind of remember from when I was a kid was you know, constantly having to fidget with the screen to avoid ceiling lights, lamps, uh, sunlight, anything that basically caused glare on the screen. So hopefully we've got that resolved. It's gonna put me at a disadvantage for trying to play games, obviously, because I'm not able to sit properly, but that's okay. Uh, let's uh, fire it up here. I, I am going to be going cordless, or at least power cordless. Uh, there is a cord in the back here, but that's the composite cable to the monitor that's sitting next to it. So I'm definitely not cheating on this one. I'm quite impressed that it takes any charge whatsoever, but I bet we'll probably get maybe a couple minutes out of it before it completely dies. Anyway, uh, let's uh, fire it up here. We've got uh, DOS 2.11 in the drive, and I got that from an image that was made of a Toshiba boot disk, an original one. So I think it's the correct DOS for this machine. I don't really know 100% if it's the exact boot disk that was used for these machines, but close enough we'll turn it on there and you can see it's doing the wavy thing which it normally does and there's our memory test <laughs> and yeah the memory test takes a little while it's counting up 512 kilobytes seemingly like bit by bit here And there it goes. And look at that. MS-DOS 2.11. And that's it. That doesn't take very long to load at all. Uh, and we can see that uh, everything's fully working with the disk drive, which is great. Yeah. I mean, you know, if, if you've got this on the right angle, it actually looks pretty nice and sharp. It's just the problem is getting it on the right angle and not having any background light to uh, cast glare on it. But yeah, that looks pretty good. Okay, so I'm gonna reach around. And there goes the DOS disk. <laughs> we'll just try a random smattering of games here. Um, got Load Runner, Burger Time, and Seamus on this one. Let's see what load looks like. Load runner is usually a pretty good test of compatibility. Uh, and we got a blank screen. Oh, okay. Just doesn't want to show the title screen. That's okay. Um, okay, so this is where I just died. <laughs> uh, yeah, this is not very easy with these keys. Wow. 
That was bad. Picture's nice and sharp, though. <sighs> really? Nope. It's been a long time since I've played this by keyboard. I just don't. There. Trapped. Okay, where's my up? <laughs> okay, this this arrangement of arrow keys sucks. It's so bad. Because your fingers, you know, your 30 years of muscle memory, you want to use the middle up for up. And the up is actually way over to the right there. So that's a lot harder <laughs> with those keys arranged the way they are. And uh, it's too bad this thing doesn't have an external keyboard plug-in because that would really help. But uh, I, I think with enough practice, you can get used to it. It's just, you know, you're used to having just one hand like this and you can just quickly back and forth, up, down. You can't do that with this because your up is over here and your down is over there and the left and right are in the middle, which just doesn't feel natural. They should be on the outside. Okay, well, that's one game. Yeah, let's try another game. Uh-oh, this boot failure. Oh, um, yeah, I see the low battery lights on there. And that's something that was known to happen when it ran low on batteries. It would keep running the actual computer, but the, uh, the floppy drive would stop working. So let's see. Let's do control delete. That's hilarious. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so we know the limits of the batteries are maybe a few minutes at most. But that's okay. You know what? As long as the thing is willing to start, I'm happy. Okay, so the next one I'll try is Burger Time. Now, the only experience I have playing this is uh, the Intellivision version, and I think maybe the ColecoVision version as well. And again, we have no intro screen. I'm just hitting K because that usually is for keyboard. Oh, that's actually working. Okay, well that's uh, somewhat legible. Oh, it's just remembering that the keys are not in the usual places. following me. Whoops, that's a little close. You can't really see the sausages at all. Okay. Normally I would go for that. Oh. Yeah, see this again. Having the up arrow at the far right did me in. No, no. Oh, that was lucky. Oh, so it's hitting down. This game I can actually somewhat handle because I don't need to have my finger on the, the fire button constantly. But it's just remembering how the order of things is and doing it. Oh. Come on. Oh, such a waste of pepper. And I didn't even get it. I just, you can't see. I can see my character perfectly. I can see the grid perfectly. I can see the burgers mostly, but. There we go. 
Oh, that was the wrong way to go again. Oh, we're sort of getting the theme here, aren't we? Not having keys in the right places really sucks. Okay, so this is Seamus. I dimly remember playing this. And this is going to be way hard because you do need to keep your finger on the button. No. <laughs> nope. No. <laughs> this is just... No. This is way too hard. I'm gonna go over here, get a nice good... Wow. Yeah, I sucked at that. Not my fault though. survive that. And again, I hit the wrong key. Basically, I have to wait for the enemy to align with my gun because I can't align it myself. Oh, man. Oh. This is just a no. Nope, because I'm not remembering. Okay, up, right, down. Right. Okay, well that's that. Okay, so the next one we'll try is one that I was excited about when my dad first got our first Toshiba and we brought it, uh, I think to my grandparents' house. I was like, oh, I can play computer games over there. So it was kind of a digital desert. <laughs> But uh, yeah, I quickly discovered it didn't quite look the way that you need it to to be able to play the game properly. I mean, that doesn't look as bad as I remember. I can still kind of make out some of the details. Except for the wizard. <laughs> I just, he's just a beard. My office is dusty. Oh, really? Why don't you wave your wand and sweep it yourself? Yeah, this isn't quite as bad as I remember, but it's, it's not good. You know, if there's an object that's uh, being rendered as white or whatever, like his hair there, <laughs> you're not going to find it. I mean, I do kind of like the look of these. That said, I do kind of like the way it looks in a perverse way because it's kind of like it's been sketched by pencil or something. It's, it's really, really sharp. It just doesn't have enough resolution or color depth to really do the scene justice. Not close enough now. See here, here's where not being able to see might be a bit of a problem because I don't remember where the cleaning utilities are. Yeah, this becomes a guessing game. That 
didn't do anything. The keyboard looks different than the other T1000 series machines, but uh, it appears to type the same. Still pretty nice typing experience. It's one thing Toshiba got right. I'll just check out how it looks on composite here because I'm curious. All right, so I got the composite monitor here and I'm just gonna see what things look like. I believe it's supposed to be black and white. Yep, it is. But that definitely is a lot more viewable. Yeah, it looks like it's kind of over to the left here. I don't know if that's a monitor thing or the computer. Anyway, that concludes our unexpected tour of the Toshiba T1100, their very first laptop. It is, uh, yeah, basically fully working, um, which is fantastic. You know, I didn't really have a, a lot of nostalgia for these for a really long time. Didn't even think of them really until a client of mine many years later traded in one or just basically gave it to me because there was nothing else to do with it. Uh, it was a T1100 plus or a T1200, I forget, what, one of the two that I have here. And as soon as I turned it on, all the memories start flooding back, right? You know, like, like trying to play Sierra games at my grandparents' house, trying to get the display adjusted just so, so I could actually see what was on screen, uh, the time it took to load things, and how small it seemed compared to everything else that had come before it. And that's really the thing about the T1100 is, you know, they didn't really invent the clamshell laptop. That title probably belongs to Gavilan with the Gavilan SC. I don't even think they were the second or third, but the way they put it together is what makes it special. It's so compact, it's so simple, and, you know, it's a testament to the build quality that, you know, nearly 40 years later, it's still working. It still turns on, it still wants to do stuff. And uh, it's also really quiet. Like, you, modern laptops, you turn them on, you hear fans, you hear all kinds of things. But this, the only time you hear any kind of sound out of it whatsoever is when the floppy drive is going. There's no case fan, there's no CPU fan. There isn't a need for one. It doesn't get hot enough to do that. And there's tons of room inside the case to, to aerate everything. So there's no need for any kind of noise making fans or, or anything. And it, that's kind of the thing that kind of threw me off when I was initially trying to fix it. Uh, because sometimes I would forget, I would have the CRT switch, the one that switches between the, the internal screen and the CRT flipped in the wrong direction and I turn on and I would hear absolutely nothing. And because the memory count takes a good 30 seconds, I just assumed it wasn't working. So I probably wasted about an hour just trying to follow that rabbit hole. It, this thing doesn't even have like a, a power indicator light. Like there's nothing to tell you that it's actually turned on unless you have a low battery or unless the floppy drive is actually trying to do something. So yeah, I, I really appreciate this for what it was back at that time. Today it's, you know, rather boxy and clunky and, uh, you know, the beige is clearly dated, but compared to what we had before with the massive lunchbox style portables that were absolutely huge and heavy, this was amazing. And especially since this had batteries, so you could potentially use it when you didn't have access to a power source. That was a really cool feature for the time. Even if it didn't have a hard drive, even if it didn't have a lot of things that make PCing a little bit more comfortable, you know, it's still a great little machine and kicked off several generations of fairly well-designed machines. I don't recall, there may have been one or two bad models that I can recall in 20 something years. I used to service Toshiba laptops pretty much all the time. And yeah, they were just really well built, really solid, nice features, and they just worked. So yeah, um, I'll probably look into maybe uh, either jumpering things so that I don't need the batteries anymore or see if I can get my hands on some new NICAD cells and rebuild the pack. Uh, but for now, yeah, it, it seems to be working just fine. It's a really nice, decent shape uh, example of the first Toshiba laptop and I'm really thrilled to have it. Anyway, I gotta get back to making that other video I've been working on. Thanks so much for watching and we'll see you in the next one.
Mm-hmm. <laughs>